The following podcast may include coarse language, graphic content, and politically and or religiously sensitive material. Those of you who are offended by such content should fuck off. To learn more about Damon I Publishing and download free products, visit our website at DamonI.net. That's D-A-E-M-O-N-E-Y-E dot net. Hey there, Internet. Welcome to the Damon Eye Podcast. I am Tristan Eifler. And I am Jay Tyler Burrell. And this is the podcast where we talk about tabletop and electronic gaming, science, technology, geek culture, sci-fi fantasy fiction, and what breed of chicken is best suited for a mid-range deck in Magic the Gathering. What's your opinion on that, Tyler? My opinion is that tomatoes make the, uh, tomatoes make the best bouillabaisse. That is nonsensical. <laughs> All right. So today's podcast, this is November, actually just barely November. It'll be December in two days. Uh, just And I'm actually not recording this from my usual place in San Francisco. I'm at my parents' home for Thanksgiving break or vacation, whatever. But the topic of today's uh, podcast is science fiction versus fantasy. How do you not define fantasy. what? Not fantasy versus science fantasy. Science fantasy, science fiction, whatever. The, thing here, the difference is, is that when is it science fiction, when is it fantasy fiction? Whatever, what's the difference? How you define one is what? All right. Science fiction is a general category, but in this respect, it refers to a genre of speculative fiction that, ha- or that takes place in a futuristic setting, but all the elements of technology in that futuristic setting are based on the intuitive progression of technology from our modern setting. Cell phones get smaller, so it can be assumed that sometime in the future cell phones get so small that they're basically the size of a blood cell or a contact lens or something like that. Uh, we have, or we already have medical implants to help people, or to help people survive longer, to help people survive or overcome catastrophic injuries. So it can be assumed that in the future those implants become advanced enough to be functionally identical, if not superior to our, or to our normal organs and limbs. So you can use terminology that we use in modern day and in modern day technology and science in the future, and it's understandable and to some extent backwards compatible. Science fantasy uh, basically just throws speculative technology under the uh, speculative technology under the bus and goes full on, you know, double power to the warp core, bouncing the undeflector beam off Data's knee, just nuts. Complete techno babble. Nothing makes sense whatsoever. And essentially, technology is magic. But is that can we really draw a strong distinction there between that and what you might consider a normal fantasy like Tolkien-esque work with magic and elves and dwarves? Because you know, there's because the line can blur. I mean, the obvious example is Jack Vance's Dying Earth series. Uh, it's a very old, very classic uh, series which takes place on a far, far, far future Earth where the sun is starting to go no, approaching you know red giant but go nova. And there, you know, it seems to be on the surface kind of a typical fantasy realm, but the magic there is based off highly advanced mathematical equations, and the spells are actually stored in one's brain. So, you know, it's so far in the future they figure out how to do this, but other technology is lost. It's kind of the ultimate anachronism. So it could be considered science fantasy, but they make the – I think he makes a distinction of saying this is a so far-flung future, it's actually possible. I mean, the old uh, Clark's Law, sufficiently any sufficiently advanced uh, technology uh, is distinguishable from magic. Misunderstood. The Dying Earth series isn't exclusively fantasy or, sci- or, or science fantasy. It's actually a mixture of both. But again, they say that this is just super, super advanced technology, and who's to say that that stuff isn't possible in like millions of years? I can say my chicken is. Uh, I can say that given enough time, my chickens in the backyard will become large enough and advanced enough and grow wheels that I can use them to pull tractor trailer trucks. That doesn't mean it's going to ever happen. 
Fair point, I suppose. But I still think that the distinction can be very blurred. I mean, oh, it can be. It can be very blurry. My point. Or my point is talking about what forms the elements of one versus what forms the elements of other, and how you would want to spread or how you would want to decide which side of that or which side of that blurry line and how far across that blurry line in one direction or another you want your game you want your game world or speculative fiction world or whatever to be uh, do you want to be very hardcore into the science or just throw science under the bus and say screw it it's magic and go very far in that direction or do you want to walk somewhere closer to that middle line so I think the, uh, the the biggest uh kind of design factor is uh how much or to what degree do you want to you know take on the technology you know do you want to, do you want the technology to be exclusively something which we actually happen someday or do you want to throw that out the window like shrinking which might be possible like a million years at, at which point we pretty much mastered energy ma- matter technology where to some extent that's true but you still can't break the essential laws of physics. If you try to do some honey, I shrunk the kids stuff, you're not going to create a person who's capable of walking around you know, on little teeny tiny feet in your front yard. You're going to create a person who's so dense and their mass is still the same that as soon as they hit the ground in the front yard, they go straight down. Alternatively, if you're removing mass, that means you're removing cells. So you're not creating a little teeny tiny person. You're creating a little teeny tiny person homunculus that's just going to lay there going and drilling onto, or drilling onto the little teeny tiny shirt because they're missing 99.9% of their brain. Yeah, the, the uh, shrinking is kind of the litmus test for plausibility in science fiction. You know, you see it in some sci-fi films, but it's really beyond the pale. It really, you know, if you examine it with any degree of scientific accuracy, you see, there's so many problems uh, rot. But getting back to that uh, kind of a counterpoint, though, not you can't really address the shrinking problem is we don't really you know we can take the Lovecraftian approach and say we don't really know the laws of physics you know the laws of physics we think are correct are actually just illusionary or uh, apply to this region of space so that's another route you can go well this gets into the philosophical realm of epistemology the uh, how, the philosophy of how you know what you know and as it, or how it applies to science it's often actually it's a good class in that too <laughs> yeah it's often misunderstood that uh, science, because over time we ch- over time in science we change many of our the- uh, many of our theories and various disciplines. It's often misunderstood that that means science doesn't know anything, but that's not true. It's mm-hmm. science is just a worldwide game of hot, hot, cold. Just because you're getting hotter, but you haven't actually reached the end stage doesn't mean that you just suddenly lose all progress that you've made up until that point and it all goes away. All that progress that you made up to that point is the the foundation. And from that foundation, we're looking upwards and guessing which star is the right direction, or guessing which star is the right direction. But uh, but we still have that entire foundation to build on. And we might be wrong, or we might be wrong. It might be the second star to the left instead of the first star to the right. But as soon as we get enough evidence and can prove that it's the second star to the left as opposed to the first star to the right, that just adds another layer of the foundation, and we're now looking at a new set of stars based on the accumulated knowledge that we're standing on. It doesn't mean that all that accumulated knowledge becomes completely meaningless. It just means that we now have one more layer of knowledge with which to reach further into the future. No, I'm not debating that. I'm de- because in Call of Cthulhu, the laws of physics as we know them can be used to create firearms, which can actually kill some of the lesser servitors of the elder gods or outer gods or whatever the definition they use there. But the, their point is, is that in that system, magic is actually the advanced or the true physics of the universe. So it can be kind of used as a way to justify them, yet still somewhat plausibly call, call, call it speculative science fiction, although it's, it is a stretch. So that's just one way you can take it. Well, here's, here's something to consider. Way back in uh, the discovery of infrared and other invisible, form, or other invisible forms of light, until we, actually dis- or until we actually discovered that there was a diff- or that, uh, that there was invisible forms of light that carried far more heat than the visible forms of light, the, the idea of somebody writing in a novel about a heat ray that was invisible that could, that could burn things would have been considered a science, would have been considered a science fiction. 
or, you know, I should say science fantasy. But as soon as we discovered that invisible light that carries heat actually does exist, then it crosses the line from science fantasy to science fiction. We would still have no means of, you know, of carrying, or especially back in the you know, 1800s and 1900s, of carrying around a firearm that's capable of actually producing enough radiated energy to, uh, to cause that type of an effect. But the idea that that firearm is based on is actually, is actually true. You see, our knowledge of science can be expanded on, but we can't forget. Get, or, but we can't forget what we already know. We can discover new laws of physics, but those new laws of physics uh, can't erase or supersede existing laws of physics. Uh, actually, that's not entirely true. It's you know qu- quantum physics versus classical physics. It's we would show that that on the quantum level, uh, Isaac Newton's laws of motion, or sorry, some lo- you know classical physics. That's not entirely true. There just it just appears that way because it's the overall cumulative effect of much more complex quantum effects that's taking place on a much smaller level. So, uh, in but actuality. I- but, yeah, our discovery, uh, but our discovery of quantum physics didn't suddenly invalidate Newton's laws. It just gave us a new understanding of a new of a new realm of of a new realm of physics. Newton's laws will still describe the trajectory of ballistic of ballistic missiles. It isn't like you mm-hmm. can fire a ballistic missile and suddenly it turns into a turkey sandwich. Well, it could, well, the laws of quantum mechanics say that could happen, and just. The odds of happening are pretty much not, are pretty much nil. But the point is, is that we turned out that those laws of physics are actually derived from these other laws. So they're not the true laws that we think they are. I mean, in effect, they're good practical laws. You know, they'll, they'll describe an, on a macro scale level what will happen if you fire a bullet. But on a micro or a nanoscopic scale, they're not accurate. And ultimately, nanoscopic builds up to the macroscopic. So, I mean, that's kind of gets back to my idea of turns out these laws as we know them aren't quite are are a little more subtle than we thought they were. Actually, I mean, it doesn't invalidate them, yeah. I think it'd be a better example of saying that the laws as we know them are made up of smaller individual piece, or pieces that are, laws un, or that are laws unto themselves. And we might not know all of those smaller individual piecemeal laws, but just because we don't know law, you know, law of, or, uh, second law of thermodynamics subset 7, doesn't mean that the second law of thermodynamic subsets one through six are you know aren't perfectly valid, or that the general laws of thermodynamic second law of thermodynamics that those are subsets of becomes uh, becomes less useful. Yeah, again, it's kind of this macroscopic. It's this law that's useful for predicting, you know, our perspe- perception of the universe. But again, I may be wrong. I'm not a quantum physicist. I'm a biochemist, but I believe I heard that, you know, on the nanoscopic scale, the law of the first law of thermodynamics, energy and matter cannot be created or destroyed, seems to be kind of more or less mushy. You know, you can get these spontaneous creation of little particles or or energy quantas, if, even if they last for like a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second. Yes, it's called so, zero point. It's called zero point energy. There's thank actually you, that an was experiment it. that you can do that proves that it exists on your kitchen table with a, a mm-hmm. bell jar, two pieces of tin foil, and elect or a uh, electrical circuit attached to a light and a vacuum pump. The, uh, what you do is you put uh, you put the uh, two pieces of metal of a metal foil so that they're hanging down in the bell jar, but there's about uh, but there's a gap between them of about say an eighth of an inch. And then you pump all the air out of the bell jar, and you run an, you run uh, one pull of the electrical circuit to each of the metal pieces that are sticking out of the rubber stopper that you have uh, that you've melted them around in order to form a vacuum seal, and you have like a nine volt battery and a light, and you just wait for the light to turn on. You can run the experiment several several times, and the light will always turn on. The t- which means the two pieces of metal have come into contact with one another. The only way that could happen in a vacuum is if there's something in the vacuum that uh, has more of an electrostatic presence around the two pieces on the outside than between the two pieces, essentially pressure. If you have, or if you, uh, have a liquid medium inside, it, the same thing will happen. The liquid will produce enough pressure to push on for the uh, outside of the, metal, of the uh, pieces of metal to, to push them into contact with one another. So you have a vacuum, and something in that vacuum is producing pressure. That something is zero-point energy. It's a sudden, spontaneous generation 
of, two, of a, a particle and an antiparticle in physical contact with one another. When those particles and antiparticles meet, they spontaneously annihilate, returning the energy state to zero. The same, uh, uh, this happens frequently enough in a vacuum to actually generate that kind of uh, the, uh, sufficient pressure to push the two pieces of foil together. Similarly, this is also where the uh, Hawking radiation comes from. Hawking radiation used to be a speculative type of radiation uh, that was that was mathematically shown to pop, uh, to probably exist by uh, the physicist, astrophysicist Stephen Hawking. It was later mm -hmm. discovered to actually be real, which is an amazing fact in and of itself. What Hawking yeah, because radiation, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, if I'm not mistaken, that explain that kind of solves the uh, information problem with black holes, how information can be actually lost in black holes, but that's not supposed to be possible. Yeah, it, partially that's true. What Hawking radiation is is the spontaneous generation in physical proximity of a particle and antiparticle in the vacuum of space. But right on the thin barrier edge of the event horizon of a black hole, where the gravity is just strong enough to pull one particle towards it, but not strong enough to pull the particle that's just that teeniest, tiny bit further away towards it, which causes those two particles, when they generate, to separate before they can mutually annihilate. And damn, that's a lot of eights. But that second particle, the one that isn't mutually annihilated, then spins off into space. The antiparticle that's sucked into the black hole actually reduces the mass of the black hole by a microscopic infinitesimal amount. However, that microscopic infinitesimal amount multiplied the multi by the uh, multiple quintillions of such antiparticles that are being uh, produced around the event horizons of black holes are essentially the reason that when a black hole spontaneously, or when a black hole generates after the death of a sufficiently massive star, it just doesn't instantly suck in the universe or the entirety of the universe. It's the uh, it's essentially losing some of its or some of its mass and gravitational pressure to Hawking radiation. And we had no idea what was cause what the reason for the slow growth of uh, for the such slow growth of black holes was until Stephen Hawking came up with the idea of Hawking radiation. And then we started looking for Hawking radiation and we discovered it a few years ago. We actually discovered proof that Hawking radiation actually exists. And if I'm not mistaken, that's also why the little micro uh, black holes, which were described to exist in some particle accelerators, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not an astrophysicist or even a particle physicist, that's why they're really kind of harmless and why those people who are protesting over the Large Hadron Collider were kind of ill-informed, correct? Yeah, the most that one could, uh, not, uh, the most that one could reasonably, or uh, the longest that one of those could reasonably exist would be at most a couple of seconds. Add to that that they're so small that they will literally fall through the space in an atom between an electron and the uh, nucleus in the middle of the electron and never come into physical contact with either of them, except in once in a, you know, in the odds of that actually occurring are so insanely small as to be incomprehensible. As to be incomprehensible. And even if they did occur, it would have to occur. Uh, it would have to occur continuously as that atom is falling towards the center of the Earth, and even then, it would only last a couple of seconds before the Hawking radiation would or would suck out so much of its mass and energy that it causes or that it causes it to vanish completely. So, total not an issue. The worst possible thing that could possibly happen is that the Large Hadron Collider is running is you know, essentially turned up to, or tuned up to 12 on the settings, running continuously, spontaneously generating black holes, again, continuously, at which point the black holes eat enough of, uh, and the random dice rolls of them coming into contact with physical matter occurs continuously, at which point the black holes eat a sufficient amount of the accelerator coils to cause it to spontaneously shut down. And that's the worst that could happen. I mean, it sounds like these micro black holes are just basically alpha radiation at best. The worst thing that okay. could possibly happen with micro black holes is that the Large Hadron Collider shuts down for a couple of days and it costs a few thousand dollars worth of repairs to swap out the coil. 
All right. So I think I think we're getting a little off topic now with all this <laughs> yeah. with all this science. Yeah. So let's get back to the main topic. So again, so again, the distinction is, you know, is it is it plausible science or is it a non plausible science? I mean, but again, you point out a couple about ten minutes ago that you know when we discover new laws of physics or new understanding, the what was. Uh, science fantasy, as you put it, becomes science fiction or speculative fiction. Therefore, the line, I think, is kind of blurred. Yeah, that's basically what blurs that line. But by the similar token, going back to the particle accelerator example, our experiences that we've gotten with the, or with the particle or with the Large Hadron Collider prove that something like a hand-portable black hole gun would just be completely impossible by the laws of, or by the laws of physics. We could discover new laws of physics in the future that can describe exactly the individual subset reasons why it's impossible, but the macro reason that we have from experimentation that shows it's impossible would not be invalidated by future laws. So let's bring this, steer this back to kind of gaming a little bit. So one way of, you know, creating um, science, uh, if you want to do kind of a harder science fiction setting is, but you want to incorporate something which will enable space travel is to decide, you know, like you did, or in the case of Dead Stars, that uh, psionics allow for short range, fast in life teleportation. So you decide, okay, there's this one law of physics we haven't discovered yet and involves zero point energy slash, you know, the human brain slash psionics. It's a bit more of a stretch than usual, but it's what allows us to go tra- faster than light. Another I'll, example. I'll, go, go, freely, go ahead. I'll freely admit that even though the Dead Star setting, mm-hmm. uh, even though the Dead Star setting is an extremely uh, science fiction oriented setting as opposed to science fantasy, I'll freely admit that the introduction of psionics is a complete science fantasy element. But I did so, uh, I introduced psionics expressly for the uh, ability to uh, have faster than light space travel without introducing a lot of issues of faster than light space travel, the speculative methods that we are considering right now are uh, raised. Like how uh, a faster than light weapon, a faster than light spaceship can also be described as a doomsday weapon, no matter its size. Yeah, and what about what's the problem with the with creating a warp bubble like they do in Star Trek? Oh, with exotic or with the presence of exotic or with the presence of exotic oh, yeah. energy, uh, exotic matter, and the amount of energy that would be necessary to actually produce one being of uh, we could take a starship about the size of a you know mid sized yacht and. Uh, We've gotten the mass now down to the point where we've discovered a way to create that war- to create that warp bubble around it to allow it to travel at fast to allow it to travel at faster than light speeds. But the amount of energy needed to create that warp bubble is equivalent to the mass energy ratio of the moon. <laughs> so Not basically. Yeah, plug in the mass of the moon to the equals mc squared law. You multiply the mass of the moon by the speed of light in a vacuum. That's quite a large number. And so that, what you could well actually, and that's the reason any or that's the reason any starship, no matter the size, is a or is a doomsday weapon, because in order for that starship that's in the warp bubble to stop being in the warp bubble to be able to stop and actually explore, say, the surface of another planet, it has to discharge the equivalent mass energy of the, uh, the all the energy of the warp bubble, i.e. the equivalent mass energy of the moon, at which point it stops and around the orbit of the planet, or around, let's say, orbiting an alien planet, and detonates with the, or with the equivalent amount of, of a mass energy of the moon, which is about the, uh, the same as saying a hydrogen bomb the size of the moon in the orbit of a planet. Oh, did I say planet? I meant cloud of expanding vapor. Okay, that's true, but you could take that one that one problem and then fix it with an element of science fantasy. Say they developed some sort of quantum trick to generate, you know, virtual matter, virtual exotic matter that only lasts long enough to be used. I mean, it's 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 it is science f- fantasy, but they if you fix that one little problem, suddenly it becomes a plausible. You know, it, everything else becomes science uh, fiction, science speculative fiction. That's another way you could have done it. Yeah, that would be, that would have been one way I could have done it, but there's also other issues that come up into that, such as drone weaponry. Well, compare that to say creating psionics. Which one is a little more implausible? <laughs> no offense. Well, no, I'm not saying that psionics is impossible. Uh, is plausible. What I'm saying 
is that the reason that I used psionics for FTL travel in dead stars is because it eliminated a lot of the issues that come up with uh, fast and light space travel. One of them, like I said, is how all the speculative ideas that we have right now are equivalent. Just the fact that running them is the same as say, or the same as having a doomsday weapon uh, that's uh, traveling through space. But another problem is the po er, is drone faster than light weaponry. Uh, the ability to project a weapon going so fast that it is literally undetectable until the time or until the time of impact, at which point you have planetary bombardment, planet uh, planet killer problems. If your uh, FTL system is based on the fact that there's a living person inside said drone weapon, well, that creates a lot of resource issues just in and of, in and of itself. No, and, no, it's a, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's I agree. That's a good. It's good for the science. It creates an interesting story. But again, the, the idea here is how hard do you want your science fiction to be? Yours, the system, it's good. I like the fact that you need a living pilot. That kind of gets into that you know Dune quality where it has to be some biological component. It makes it a more interesting study than to say the X magical, the X super magical uh, drive lets you go faster than light. I agree. But if you want it to be a little harder, you could do something which basically exploits that little quirk I mentioned and create an actual work bubble. That would make it a little bit of a harder sci-fi. I mean, it's still, you have to have that little element of science fantasy, as you mentioned, but it becomes a little more, I think, closer to what reality might be, depending upon what we find in the future. So, and again, the decision here is how... Yeah. How hard do you want your science fiction? Do you go the psionics route or do you go, you know, tweak this one little thing and make and makes everything better? You know, because sometimes technologies like that just takes one little invention and suddenly you have a host of other follow-up inventions because this is one trick that solves a lot of problems. Yeah, one of the uh, when I was writing the Dead Star setting, there is one method of speculative FTL travel that I was seriously considering using for the Dead Star setting. But I decided against it because it eliminate, or it essentially eliminates the capacity for exploration, and that's an entangled gate. What that is, or the way in, uh, entanglement, spooky action at a distance, is when you have two identical particles that are chemically and magnetically separated, or chemically and electrostatically separated from their surrounding mediums. You hit each of those particles with a split photon, uh, uh, which causes both of those particles to uh, to uh, essentially start or uh, have the same spin information, at which point any changes to one particle's spin information are mirrored in the other particle. Particle A start you know, is hit with an electron that causes, or sorry, hit with a photon that causes it to suddenly uh, the electron in its covalent shell to jump to the next highest energy state covalent shell. Which cause uh, what that'll happen is that the uh, I. The, the identical particle to the other end, the same electron around that particle will instantaneously jump down one layer in its covalent shell and shed the photon that the original particle absorbed. Both particles then uh, retain the same amount of energy, so you're not violating the lo you know, laws of entropy of thermodynamics. The energy, total energy of the universe hasn't changed. But what uh, happened was essentially the photon goes in one particle and spits out the other particle instantaneously, and we've proven that this occurs at a speed faster than light. And the reason this happens is because there's more than the four dimensions we're familiar with, the three dimensions of our physical world plus the fourth dimension of time. There are extra dimensions that exist only at the subatomic level, and when you entangle to, uh, when you entangle two particles, what you're doing is you're causing them to uh, become uh, to go and in, become into physical contact with one another across one of those subatomic dimensions. So as far as those particles are concerned, the, they could be light years apart, but the particles think they're in the same space. Using that, uh, it's speculated that if we dumped enough of energy of, at the uh, at the uh, right re at the uh, right resonant frequency to the uh, to the particles in question and to a large enough field of particles, it's speculated that we could actually essentially make a uh, shortcut through space time, allowing one gate to open up onto an identical gate across the fabric of space, just as if you were stepping through a doorway. So it's basically portal, <laughs> basically. But the problem with that is. We have to project the other gate using just 
regular travel through space, like on a rocket or something, or on a solar sail, to the destination point, and then turn them on. So you have a gate flying through space to get to another star system, and even if that star system is as close as just a couple of light years away, that gate's going to be flying for centuries. Mm -hmm. So it's faster than light, but it's not faster than light. Yeah, once you have it set up, travel between the gates is faster than light, but you have to set up the gates, which is a massively slower than light process. And because of that, it makes exploration in any sort of, of a comprehensible time, a time frame that's comprehensible to normal people. It makes exploration just completely impossible, which in a game setting makes exploration completely impossible. So I basically scrapped it and just went with the science fantasy uh, ooga boo goo. Plug somebody's brain into uh, plug somebody's brain into a computer and tell or into the uh, ship's computer and electrical system and tell them to go that away. Yeah. Well, one idea that you could do is you could produce perpetual energy. It's not truly perpetual. What you're doing is you're actually exchanging gravitational or gravitational energy for uh, for kinetic energy. But you take two of these gates that are on a relatively smaller scale. You put one at the bottom of a body of water and the other above the same body of water. And that will create a perpetual cycle where water flows in one gate and out the other gate. And then you just put like a water wheel attached to a generator between the two and poof, perfect, or a functionally perpetual energy. Okay, so let's kind of let's kind of move on a little bit to what I thought the podcast was originally going to focus on, which is more kind of the science fiction and fantasy settings. Do you think um, sometimes they they are blurred and sometimes they are like purposely blurred? So you get like dragons uh, with, with with cyber tech. I mean, there there have been a bunch of those. They they've never been very successful because they get it just feels a little goofy at times. Uh, can you think of any setting which kind of successfully married those two things besides besides Shadowrun? I don't count Shadowrun. <laughs> Uh, besides, damn it, I was just about to use that as an example. Yes, there's one that's uh, there's uh, one that was recently produced as a D20 expansion setting, and by recently produced, I mean like a, about a decade ago, of course. You know, in comparison to Shadowrun, <laughs> but uh, it was called uh, what the heck is the name of it? It was called a uh, like Dragon Star, I think was the name of it. Oh yeah, I know that one. Yeah, it was actually yeah, I, I... a really really interesting setting. But some of the rules that they used for merging science and uh, science fiction and fantasy were kind of kludgy and didn't really work very well. I mean, it still has a following, but most people who play it use a lot of house rules or communally developed rules to fix those self-same kludges. Which is actually a nice segue to kind of the question I want to, another question I want to ask here, which is when you have, if you want to try a thing like that. What's the best way to reconcile these two things, you know, where you have one where you're just ignoring this, the laws of science and, you know, physics and so forth, other one where you kind of have to stick to them? How do you reconcile them? I think one of the better ones that – one of the better systems or sayings or games that did that was Arknum. Oh, in the very I first, love in, that computer game. Yeah, it's if you haven't found it, if any of our listeners haven't tried it out, I mean, you could probably find it at good old games or elsewhere. But make sure you get the um, um, the patch that was actually fan made that fixes all these problems because the developer was made a good game, but it's kind of infamous for making uh, a lot of buggy a lot of buggy games. But they fixed all that for the fans, and that tells you just how dedicated this fan base is. Especially now, since think, this was back in the day, far before mod community existed. And the only way to fix a game was to decompile it by hand so that you could get back to the original files and then recompile the, or recompile the patch so that it would be interfaceable with the compiled version of the game. It was a massive undertaking. I mean, making even the smallest change would require, or would require tens of, uh, tens of, uh, man's hours, uh, tens of man's hours worth of work, like 30, 40 man hours worth of work just for, like, adding a new sword to the game. Tyler, there were always mod communities. There were mod communities back in the day when they were basically just all roguelikes because anyone who could play those games often could program them. So they just, they just the mod communities just weren't as large and just, you know, they were just more, they were just smaller and more skilled. There have always been mod communities. Yeah, right. that's true. I did, uh, back in the day when I was, or back in the day, I did modify Wing, Command, or Wing Commander Privateer so that there was a homing weapon in the game. Yeah. So anyways, I mean, what I like about Arkham is that, you know, in the very first village you go to Stillwater, there's this junk guy who explains to you how this works. You know, 
Laws of science work by exploiting the laws of physics. Laws of magic change the laws of physics temporarily so they can do whatever you want. So the, yeah, so the more of one you have, the harder of the other it is to use. Yeah, and that actually kind of makes sense. That I mean, it's well, not really, but at least there's some logic to it, and you can see why they oppose it. Sets up this natural diametric of opposition going on. What? Yeah, you can still see a point where some people try to merge the two. I mean, that's actually one of the one of the main plot points is how they mer- they create this portal to the basically limbo through this magic tech, which is very hard to do because they are kind of in opposition. But that was a good merge of the two of the two concepts. So I think that was one way to go when you want to merge science and technology. Uh, you mean science and fantasy? Sorry, science and fantasy. Blech. I'm not thinking straight. Anyways, can you think of any other examples? How about an example which didn't work very well uh, apart from uh, Dr- uh, Dragon Star? Iron Crown Enterprises, uh, I, I think it was uh, called something, I think it was called something like Meadowlands or something like that, is you know, fairly back in the day. They tried to make, uh, they basically tried to make technology function like magic. And then similarly, there was another one called uh, Rift. Oh, that was oh, so horrible. Oh, Rifts. Rifts is Rifts has a very dedicated fan base, though. I mean, it's a bit like GURPS. They're you know, it's small in these little pockets, but they're very dedicated and they keep the company aloft somehow. Yeah, but the reason for those two fan bases are diametrically opposed. People love the Rifts setting because the act, or love Rifts because the setting is so awesome, even though the rules massively suck. And I agree with them. The Rifts setting is freaking spectacular. Now, if only it had a decent rule set. The flip side to that is the flip side to that is the GURPS system, where the rules are insanely tight to put, tightly put together. I mean, it is. I, a, it is, I take I take issue at that to well, some point. It's Tyler. a rule system that has very very few bugs in it. Is my point. The, yeah, but it's a system which would be ra- which would almost you have to run from a computer to make it go to keep the flow going. Well, I mean, that's just it. The settings for the GURPS system are aren't are rarely written with the GURPS system in mind. You have to basically go through the GURPS rule book and almost write your own rule book that's an accumulation of the rules as presented that you actually want to use. It makes it or it makes it so that. Uh, even though the rules are very good, it makes it very hard to actually run a game because the setting is never quite fully interfaces with the rules, as opposed to Rift, where the setting interfaces with the rules great. It's just that the rules suck. Well, but the problem with the GURPS is that it's a generic universal role-playing system. It tries to do everything, which and therefore kind of it can't do everything very well. That's the problem. That's the the drawback and the strength of the system. I wouldn't call it streamlined or good or the best rule system, though, Tyler. I mean, there are t- it has tons of and tons of tons of options, tons and tons of little rules. They, it's it's I think it's not the best system, honestly, but it, it can do a lot of things. I'll give it that. It's a Swiss Army knife of, of systems, I I'm think. I'm not referring to it as the best system in terms of it being the easiest to run. I'm referring to it as the best system in terms – or not the best system, but a really, really damn good system in terms of how few uh, rules – how few uh, flaws there are in the rule sets. You All can right, take, fair enough. You can take rule sets from widely disparate source books and – Try and run them in the same game together, and you won't, and you won't break, and you still won't break the rules. It's just that the game is probably going to bog down into nothing but rules fest. That's not true for all this, all the rules, though, Tyler. I mean, a lot, maybe the core rules, yeah, they're pretty tight, but they have a lot of different source books and and optional rule books, and some of them are pretty crappy. I mean, oh yeah, some Gerp, of them are. GURPS vehicles, anyone? I keep bringing back that up as an example, but it's really the best example there is. GURPS vehicles. <laughs> oh yeah, GURPS vehicle. Well, actually, that's the prime example of of uh, of what I'm trying to say. The actual oh, yeah, rules true. material <laughs> in, GURPS, in GURPS vehicles is very very tight. Using GURPS vehicles is damn near impossible. Okay, other examples might be I don't know some of the magic settings, magic rules, which aren't which are a little iffy. That's why that'd be a better example. Some GURPS magic stuff. So yeah, uh, so other example, other examples of sci-fi fantasy. I mean, well, well let's start with an example. Let's talk about you know how you want uh, if you want to do a Star sorry. Wars. Go ahead, Star Wars. Star Wars. Oh. 
Star Wars, yeah, I mean that's um, that's it's hard to pin that one down. I mean there are other there are other games like that, other settings and games and movies and stories like that where it's like it's expl- it's a, 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 ostensibly science fa- sci-fi because it's in space, but it's really kind of fantasy based. I mean it's like a space fantasy or a space opera fantasy or something. Well, no, Star Wars is a good example of a setting that takes a science fiction setting, even though it's not quite so hard science fiction. But it takes a science fiction setting and tosses in blatantly fantasy elements with the Force and Jedi and all that stuff. But well, not the, just that. Yeah, yeah. But the reason I brought up Star Wars, actually, was from the rules example. Because Star Wars, and its history, and the history of games that use Star Wars rules, has a, a perfect example of the incomplete range of success to failure ratio in terms of merging science fiction and fantasy. The original Star Wars rules for the Star Wars role-playing game way the hell back in the day from Fantasy Flight. That'll be West End, game, that'll be West End Games uh, system, I believe. I actually have a copy of that. Oh, yes, it's, it was West End Games. It was a, yeah. very well put together. It worked. Oh, I loved it. Yeah, it worked spectacularly well. It's just that it was a, a system that people had a hard time getting into because it existed only for that game. Still, even today, there are a lot of real, there are a lot of fans of the original West End game system, and the books are still being uh, the books are still uh, you can still get the books at various places online, expressly because it was so it was so well done. And then you have uh, once uh, Star Wars was licensed by TSR and they used it and they uh, used it for essentially the D20 modern version one or beta version test. And D20 Modern was a bag of dunk, or was a bag of dog dung to begin with, but the beta test version that was they used for uh, Star, uh, for uh, Star Wars was even worse. It was, you know, not nothing in it was balanced, even remotely, or even remotely balanced. It was just like a massive book of rules that were that just screamed that they were written for different games and shoved together and then shoved up the door with a license with a license attached. And I honestly think it was just a, a huge system to fool people into playtesting the alpha version of the D20 Modern rule set and get them to pay for it. But then after D20 Modern crashed and burned, and they took another look at it, the Star at the uh, Star Wars D20 rules after they came out with uh, after they uh, started development on version 3.5, they came out with another ver- with what the Star Wars D20 Modern rules are today, and it doesn't quite work, but at least the two sides of the coin, the force-based fantasy side is completely balanced, and the tech-based blasters, cyberware, and robot side is completely balanced. It's just that the rules, when you try to put them together, don't quite mesh. Like quantum physics and uh, Einstein's theory of relativity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good example. So how do you mesh? What's, what elements allow these settings to work and what didn't let them work? So in Arcanum, what, what made it work? Internal consistency. And, cro- uh, and balanced cross compatibility. The magic system was completely internally consistent. Essentially, each magical discipline was a mirror image of every other magical discipline, just you know, in a funhouse mirror. Things were twisted around, but everything, uh, but everything was always balanced. If you had rank three in necromancy and rank three in elemental fire, either way, you were still a perfectly balanced character. A rank 3 elemental uh, necromancer had just as easy a time getting through the game as a rank 3, fi- as a rank three elemental fire, wi- uh, fire wielder. Similarly, if you, had a not, if you had a more tech-oriented character, and you had a character with rank 3 firearms, or, and a character with, say, rank, or say, with a rank 3 brawling, both of those cases, the characters would have just as easy a time getting through the game, uh, to, or as a, as one another, the firearms guy would be swinging at the gunshots, and the brawling guy would be running into a fight and beating people down. And in either case, it would be just as easy to get through the game. Now, then, then you come into cross compatibility, where you are comparing, say, the firearms guy to the elemental fire guy, and you see how easy it is for them to get through the different uh, challenges, uh, challenges and levels of the game. Now, if the firearm guy can basically breeze through uh, 
say, a quarter of the game content, and the Elemental Fire guy has a hard time getting through even uh, half of what the uh, half as far as the firearms guy can get through. Then you have a balance issue that uh, in cro uh, yeah, cross compatibility issue. You have a situation where one entire discipline on the science versus fantasy side is inherently weaker or, or stronger than the other entire di than the other entire discipline. That's a point where uh, that's the point where the modern version of the um, current version of the D20 rules for Star Wars fails, is because if you're playing a force wielder, the game is a cakewalk compared to playing a, a blasting wielding space you know space rogue and solo type. Okay, now that's that's a good point. But let's think about more the more setting wise, more story wise. You know, because sometimes, like I said, the uh, meshing of the science fiction fantasy. You know, not just not just the technology, but also societies and cultures can feel kind of goofy or conflicted. In Arkham, it kind of you know it had a kind of, it kind of worked, and in Star Wars, it worked very well. And other things like Dragon Star feels a little weird. You know, when you have the yeah. yeah so true. what worked well. To some extent, you can actually use, from a game design standpoint, you can actually use social interactions as a means of balancing game content. Uh, for instance, you can have a setting where magic is a little bit more powerful than technology, but, peop uh, but the society as a whole is distrustful enough of magic users so that uh, your magic user can, you know, his spells are going to be always more reliable and more powerful than the guy walking around with black powder, with black powder, with a black powder. No, 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 I, 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 sorry, Tyler, sorry to interrupt. I mean more, you know, not just in terms of balancing, but in terms of the, the setting the society feel natural or even plausible. Does it, you know, the fact that, that potions are so powerful, why do they still develop, uh, say, advanced medical technology? That's more what I'm getting at here. Ah, uh, there has to be a or there has to be a reason why there has to be some inherent flaw in the nature of one discipline or another that the opposite discipline actually addresses a good example actually that you brought up is potions in order to or in order to make a potion you have to or you have to have magic and you have to have potion making uh, skills but in order to make or, or in order to be able to make and therefore utilize potions but Anybody can take a Band-Aid and put, them up, put it over a wound. Yes, the potion is going to be far more effective at healing that wound, but the, band, uh, but the box of Band-Aids is cheaper and more universally usable. Okay, so then we have, I think this, we have this other question, question I think to consider where we have an issue where magic and technology arise together, you know, arise together like they did kind of in Arknum and in Star Wars. But what if you have an issue where it's like two worlds collide, where somehow science fiction meets fantasy and it's like several decades afterwards? Then you have this... Actually, that's the situation in Dragon Star. Uh, that Dragon Star always felt a lot like the... Um, old British colonial days where you have British colonists coming across native peoples and the native peoples, if they you know, might, might, very might be advanced far enough to be able to make, uh, to be able to make uh, iron spearheads or, you know, for their spears compared to British colonists who are walking around with, are walking around with freaking black batter guns and, or, and bronze or black batter guns and personal body armor that made are made out of a heart are made out of a refined steel and a comparison between uh, that that's essentially the reason the British Empire grew so large and so huge and so fast is because they massively outpaced the tech of the people they were coming across now if the people they were coming across didn't have an advance didn't need a, a lot of technology because they were replacing it with functional magic an entire new history would have developed on Earth. Now, in Dragon Star, you have a situation where you have an advanced, a technolo technologically advanced culture is going out and making contact with magically advanced cultures, but the technologically advanced culture also has magic to counter the other guy's magic, which basically turns every, er, every fight into a gunfight, and only one side has guns. Yeah, so it's a question of which one is superior then, or are they superior, or is it just a matter that one discipline has more science and the science overall outweighs the magic? I think a big reason why some settings work and other settings don't 
is because you have um, either one, or either magic, or either a magic or technology is filling a role that the other can't fill by you know by its inherent nature or by its inherent nature. Therefore, the two are essentially forced to coexist, even if that coexistence is a uh, not very friendly. Or you have a situation where one group who possesses magic or technology is incapable or extremely limited in their ability to access the other discipline. So both disciplines essentially fill the same role. Somebody, let's say, who casts fireballs requires crystals as a reagent to cast fireballs, and the crystals are relatively hard to produce compared to somebody who uses firearms, requires bullets to shoot the firearms, and the bullets are relatively hard to produce. In that kind of situation, you have two identical characters with identical problems. But if one character is, say, let's say the guy with the gun is a dwarf, and dwarves are inherently non-magical and therefore can't use magic or can use magic only to a very limited extent, whereas on the other side you have, let's say, an elf, and because of an iron allergy, the elves can't even hold a firearm without essentially burning their hand, making it so that they have to rely on magic completely for or completely for damn near ev- or completely for damn near everything. In that kind of a situation, you you, know, you can have magic and technology sitting side by side, essentially being uh, used as an identifier of what of a what faction of the world you belong to. If you belong to the Dwarven faction, you're a firearms wielder. You belong to the Elven faction, you're a magic wielder. But in terms of the actual mechanics of the game, the two are almost completely identical. You're just tossing on the flavor of are you throwing a a small ball of fire or are you throwing a small ball of hot lead? Yeah. And so you think that the, the, does it make any difference the saying is more of a magic and science grew up together or this is where they, they met, they clashed because two societies met at some point. Do you think that makes a difference in this in the setting? It makes a large difference in the attitude of the setting, but it doesn't make any difference in the quality of the setting. You can write a good setting with uh, whether uh, magic and technology are working together or whether they're clashing. It doesn't really doesn't really matter in terms of whether or not the setting is a well developed and realized and very playable setting. It just matters in terms of how of what direction the setting takes. Yeah, so they so you could go either way with those. You could have you know uh, a cro- kind of what's basically a crossover fic fanfic, or you can have kind of an Arkham situation where they have these two forces or these two philosophies growing up together. It depends on which direction you want to go with it. Okay. Yeah, uh, let's see. What else? What else? What else? So I love. I, mean, I love how damn near every podcast we've done so far, we always reference Arcanum. Well, it's a good system and it's awesome. And actually, speed of which we should have talked this about this a little earlier. Steampunk, steampunk in general. Steampunk. That's the ultimate. In general, is this the ultimate? You know, because it, it kind of. I mean, it kind of works. It takes kind of this Victorian or what? I'm not sure the saying is. You know, mysticism and this advancement of. You know, industrial revolution merges them, and it, and it kind of works. I well, mean, steampunk is science, is Victorian tech science fantasy, uh, basically. And steampunk, by its nature, doesn't have anything to do with uh, anything to do with. What but it's so easy to magic. incorporate magic, though. Exactly. But it's so easy. Uh, yeah, I mean, sorry, go yeah, ahead. Arcanum, as an example, is a or is a very steampunk heavy uh, version of science. At our version of science incorporated in a setting that also has magic, just because ste- or just because steampunk is science fantasy, but it's based on a technological concept that's so uh, that's uh, so old that we can pretty much laugh at most of the science fantasy and stuff it does because we do that today with real with actual real technology. But uh, because the basal technology that is based on old Victorian era steampunk and clockwork kind, kind of stuff is so uh, is so primitive, that makes it very close to what we commonly conceive of as the quote unquote magical technology level of the old medieval settings, which means that steampunk, which means that steampunk and magic can be meshed very well together in a setting because our common conception of what a magical setting is is very close to our common conception of what a steampunk setting is. 
Well, but I mean, it also, it also invokes that, you know, that age, the industrial age, you know, that Victorian still, you know, a lot of it was almost still science, like they were still exploring this, this, vat, this new frontier. And there were a lot of, you know, some people thought that, you know, magnetism could like uh, cure diseases, you know, all those, those full, those full um, inventions, which turned out to be quackery later on. But the idea is that, you know, that there's still that spirit that there, that maybe what we thought of magic is actually technology that could be exploited. And it's what they thought. And that's why it kind of fit and makes sense and feel has kind of this cohesive whole to it and that's why it, fe- it works well as a setting it has kind of this internal consistent I would say consistency but this internal identity that extends in all directions and that's why it it kind of works in, as a setting and it works as in, and it can work mechanically you know this the approach to it oh since you brought it up steampunk medical quackery uh-huh. if anybody listening to this podcast What's a prime example of steampunk medical quackery? Research Kellogg's cornflakes. <laughs> it is hilarious. I I have to say I don't know that one, so I'll have to do that after the podcast and do a search for it. Uh, the guy who came up with Kellogg's cornflakes was a big uh, used a lot of the of the money that he uh, that he got for, uh, for his uh, food invention to fund a medical clinic that used nothing but steampunk style medical quackery to try and cure diseases. Stuff like, you know, stuff like cold water baths, uh, magnetic therapy, things to do with the anus that we won't mention on a podcast. Well, I mean, they already kind of have that in a lot of spas right now, and it's considered legitimate. <laughs> yeah. You know, some bad ideas never die. They just go into hibernation. Do you know they still offer like radioactive water over uh, in Europe and in, in, in I, forget, I forget what it's called. It's like Joachim Valley or something. As a as radioactive a, water for people who really don't like their thyroid gland. Yeah, I mean they still offer it as being really good for you. But you know the funny thing is is that you know again going back to that steampunk when uh, when Madame Curie was still you know researching radioactive material, they show that it was able to actually you know exposure to these radioactive materials, uranium and so forth. It was actually able to destroy tumors. And it's yeah. and it and that was still used. I mean, so may, that's kind of the prime example of you know this pseudo science tech. You know, all you have to do is just take add one element again of science fantasy, as you put it, and say, okay, maybe maybe you know radiation does work like that. It's a wonder drug. You know, like you know. And that, well, going back to going back to where we started with epistemology, the idea behind steampunk is okay. Real world science. We stood, or back in the Victorian era, we were standing on a relatively small platform looking up at a massive uh, field of possibilities and pointing in one direction and saying, hey, maybe that works. And then we discovered that our idea of, hey, maybe that works was completely wrong, like phlogiston and, uh, like a phlogiston. Oh, phlogiston, yeah. Well, you know, well, what steampunk basically is, is it asks the question, hey, what if those, or what if that, maybe that works stuff with flood or things like phlogiston was actually right? Mm-hmm. And another example of that would be the Fallout series. Yeah, there's no real magic in Fallout, but yeah, I agree with you. And Fallout radiation basically is magic. Well, I mean, yeah, we're not just talking about just fantasy, like you said in the beginning of the podcast. Also, just science fantasy. You know, it's it's kind of just advanced steampunk. Yeah. Yeah. That's very true. Yeah. That's very, very true. And they didn't develop, and it's this anachronism slash advanced technology. They didn't develop these microcircuitries, so they just advanced, they, they somehow developed these super efficient, super compact uh, energy sources. And Well, essentially, essentially, Fallout is the same idea as the steampunk that I just, as the steampunk epistemology, only the basal tech level instead, uh, instead of being old Victorian era tech. The basal tech level is 1950s tech, which explains why everything looks like it came out of a 1950s science, uh, pulp science fiction novel, is because essentially it did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, we're getting near the end of our hour-long podcast, but we can extend a little bit further. So let's end it by asking this question. Uh, are there any novel ways you think to make a cohesive science meets fantasy, you know, a new new approaches to it which might actually work, you know, not just mechanically but also conceptually, you know? Huh. That's a good question. I mean, that's what? that's like the seed of a of a new game. But are, what's what is, what are good way techniques of experimenting of you know adding things? Like, could you is it taking just one element from fantasy and introducing it to uh, otherwise normal worlds? You know, it's almost akin to like doing fanfic work. I mean, that's not and, it's, and honestly, that's not a bad place to go for inspiration. I hate to admit it, as long as you don't blatantly rip it off some of the ideas. 
one idea I've been like you know experimenting with just as kind of a conceptual exercise is the idea of a, a dimensional of a, a dimensional engine. Uh, you take the typical fantasy idea, uh, fantasy idea concept where you have uh, multiple planes of reality that are all kind of like leaves in a book right next to each other, but each plane is massively different from, or massively different from the uh, from other planes. And you experiment with the idea that uh, what or that uh, you have planes where the laws of physics are inher- are massively different than the laws of physics of the plane that it borders. And the law of plane that it borders, which would basically be our plane, we discover some physical law that allows us to create like a box or something like that where you push a button and a radius around you in, uh, basically imports the laws of physics of the plane that the, but- that the box is associated with, allowing you to do stuff like, let's say, in one plane, Whenever you crack an egg, or whenever you uh, an egg cracks, it develop or it explodes into a fireball. So you could push that button and say you have a 20 foot radius around you now, where every time an egg cracks, it produces a fireball, and you just so happen to have a pocket full of hard boiled eggs. Yeah, that, that's kind of been done before. The dimensional hopping aspects. I think that one example is the Number of the Beast uh, series of novels for the author. But yeah, that's the idea that you know br- bridging like little pockets of one dimension to another to do stuff. That's that's actually kind of an original way of approaching, you know, uh, bending the laws of nature and creating new saying. I mean, that's kind of how my very, very old um, uh, forum role-playing game, Grey, went to a certain extent. I think another approach, which, again, isn't very original, but it's only because it, one franchise kind of took this idea and ran with it, and now you can't avoid mentioning it if you use it, is, you know, the idea of a virtual world, you know, the Matrix crap. So maybe you could have a setting where everyone is in a fantasy world, but, oh, one day something gets mal- there's a mal- something malfunctions and they wake up and they're not humans or elves or dwar- I mean they're not dwarves or elves but they're these humans in these pods in this space station circling X planet you know they were put there and you know because there was a disaster on the planet on the on their planet and they had to preserve themselves until you know until disaster fallout came down and to keep their minds simulated they had to like put this game based off a very popular fantasy game on their on their planet but eventually people forgot what they were doing you know because maybe death causes the mind to kind of you know fragment or something that's yeah there's a novel series similar to that called here be dragons where uh, where, uh, people basically live inside a virtual reality world that's a fantasy based uh, that's a fantasy based world and they uh, over t- or they uh, over time start like mutating and adapting the fantasy based world uh, to cope with different problems. But another idea that I had that I'm actually right now uh, kind of working on a backburner project. Uh, for those who aren't in the know, we don't just have the uh, Dead Stars rule book out uh, for people to purchase, but we're also working on several other rule books. Currently, the rule book that's uh, next on the line to be published is a punk fantasy game. But one of the back burner rule sets that I'm working on is a uh, is a uh, kind of a uh, Victorian era, or not Victorian, but a, a Bronze era, like Roman era, uh, world filled with psionics that suddenly has magic thrust on it in the form of radiation or radioactive meteors from space. And the radiation is the force of magic. So the idea being that um, the more magical your character is, the more mutated he becomes by the fact that he uh, that he, uh, that he can use magic. So and society uh, and magic is inherently more in this setting is inherently extremely powerful. Uh, but the downside to it, though, is that you're like some mutated abomination that society hates and throws rocks at. Yeah, another way of go- another way, which again is not entirely original, but has been used a lot, is the idea of a generation ship or a giant collector ship that collects, you know, specimens from not just other planets but throughout different times, and suddenly everything malfunctions or the creator dies, and suddenly you have samurai next to, say, you know, like gangsters from the 19, 1920s or 1930s. I wish I could remember the name of the book series, but there was a book series uh, similar to that where the idea was that it wasn't a generation ship. It was a group. It was an alien race that basically came to Earth and the, this alien race collected other sentient alien races. And what they did was they would go to the home worlds of these sentient alien races 
and they would offer the population a chance for whoever among the population wants to explore the stars with them to come with them and uh, come with them and explore the stars and settle other, uh, and settle other worlds. What they didn't ever tell anybody though is that they would uh, uh, they would uh, genetically adapt the members of the uh, of the other sentient races to be in, uh, to, uh, to be able to inhabit other worlds. So you, you ha uh, so when humanity eventually develops its own space faring te uh, star faring technology and goes out into the stars and discovers the uh, uh, discovers the colonists that were taken off the planet are taken uh, the human colonists that were taken off world by this alien race. These human colonists have been forcibly adapted to be able to survive in different environments. Like suddenly you have some of them that are amphibious to survive in very water, in very water heavy worlds. You have some of them that, uh, that are, uh, eat, uh, that are like, you know, basically eat more metallic compounds to survive in very, uh, metal heavy worlds. And you have one in a world where, uh, magic is a natural, is a natural force that's like generated by some unknown element on the planet. You have one that uh, were, uh, that has the capacity for people to de actually develop spell casting, uh, spell casting skills and abilities. And the novel series takes place on that world, and it's the uh, exploration of a uh, anthropologist who's studying these magical, pe uh, studying these magical people on the world in order to get her, or in order to uh, finish off her doctorate. And gets involved in all uh, gets involved in all of these like insane political shenanigans. Uh, another example might be um, well, there are a bunch of examples of this in in, fic in novels. I mean, there it's hard to find original idea. I mean, there's the Well World series by Jack Chalker, though. To be fair, that's pretty much just a transformation fetish palooza. There's also the uh, Spellsinger series from Alan Dean Foster, which kind of says, you know, magic is just science. It's just in different ways, but science is good across all dimensions. An engineer in our world would be actually be a powerful sorcerer in their world. That's another way you can go about it. You know, the, but, uh, Oh, there's, there's the, uh, accidental sorcerer series by Simon Hawk, I believe is the author's name. Yeah. That's an example. Where you have, or, yeah. Where you have a, uh, where you have a very talented research engineer who, and who while trying to attempt to make a time machine, accidentally makes a, a machine that, bre uh, that breaches dimensional barriers and dumps them in a, in, a, a fan in a fantasy world where magic users are basically the aristocracy. And he starts showing people how to, uh, but, but the physics technology still actually works. So he starts showing people how to do things like make bars of soap rather than use cleaning enchantments. Or uh, make fiery compounds instead of trying instead of going to the local wizard to buy a uh, to buy a rechargeable uh, to buy a rechargeable wand to light your house fires, and as a result of him basically showing people how to or how to do very uh, basic mundane tasks by using technology, he accidentally causes a huge political upheaval in the or in the fantasy world because that undermines the uh, because that basically uh, undermines the uh, power or the uh, current magical power structure and it, completely accidentally the guy is like a massive doofus and has no idea what or has no idea what the uh, people he's showing how to do all of this are actually using it for high and slow wisdom again <laughs> Yeah. All right. Yeah. So obviously, it's a comedy. Yeah. So, anyways, I mean, we're, I think we're it's hard to find a really original idea way to combine them, but I think there are a lot of really good ideas which are underused in kind of the classic science fiction fantasy novels. So, I mean, that that's one way to go about it and just adapt what you have there, and, or or just make an amalgam of them. That's I think a good design uh, idea when you're making a new campaign if you want to combine science fiction and fantasy or try to do science fantasy as Tyler put it. So I think just, go ahead. Yeah, just make sure you uh, just make sure you have reasons that actually work with both your setting and the rule system. You seriously don't want an unbalanced setting, or uh, sorry, an unbalanced rule system or a setting that doesn't have any internal logical consistency. Yeah. I mean, uh, we're almost out of time here, but just one more thing there is also magical fan uh, magical uh what is that called? Uh, f uh, f f um Magical reality, I don't know what it's called. It's where you have what, where you have a single element of of fantasy and otherwise very very hard world. You know, like you have, like my my own novel series. You have werewolves, but nothing else. You know, or like or like uh, the uh, Dead Star setting where psionics is essentially a fan is essentially a, a fantasy element. 
but everything else is hard science. Yeah. Uh, I forget what it's called, but you know, I'll probably come to me like after the podcast, but that's another example of I mean, making it work where you just kind of get by by just making one little little hiccup in the road and otherwise keep it straight. That can work very well for a lot of settings too. But you can also you can also do it the flip side. You can have a you can have a fantasy world where metal or where um, modern metallurgy principles are in full effect. So you don't really need things like adamantine or mithril or any of those funky materials. You can actually have enchanted. You can actually have like enchanted swords of, reinf- of a reinforced spring steel, or you can have uh, say magical armor that's made out of Kevlar. You know, isolate aluminum or isolate titanium from titanium oxides. Yeah, that sort of thing. Okay. Yep. You know, chemistry plus magic. Yep. Whatever works. All right. I think that's going to be it for this month. Uh, so thank you for listening. This has been Tristan Eifler and... J. Tyler Burrell, Master of the, or Master of the Dork Arts. And uh, this has been uh, Damon I Podcast Episode 3, Science Fiction and Fantasy. Or Science Fantasy and Science Fiction. I'll figure out a title a little later on. Uh, I'll, let's go ahead and call it quits. I'll see you next month. Hale aqua vale. <laughs>